All right. Welcome, everyone. All right. We've got Mickey, Lewis, Kimberly, and Dutch. Let's show those screens if you can. What's up, guys? Good to see you guys. How's everybody's week going? Everybody having a big uh, right before it slows down a lot during summer? So does anybody see the summer slow down with your business? We do. People do not take courses as much. Yeah. <laughs> during I, bet. The summer. I bet. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. So Nahal, let's uh you want to just give an intro into your business and kind of uh you know the hot topics you're facing right now. Yeah, sure. So uh I'm the founder of AdPros. And uh what we do is we're a creative studio that and a media buying agency that scales brands to a million a month. Uh, and there's levels of million a month, and I can jump into that. But that's that's the core of what we do. We manage about five million a month in spend. We have uh, about seventeen people, one seven, uh, and we have them across uh, like six countries. So we're all over. Awesome. So that's uh, that's a lot. <laughs> five million spend <laughs> is that mainly through Facebook ads, or do you do you know Google and we, all the so ads? as soon as iOS fourteen happened, we had to make a decision of like, are we gonna launch a new type of business in terms of email and CRO, or are we going to go all in and do more higher risk on front end uh, traffic sources? And so we were just doing Facebook. We were huge on Facebook in terms of like, we will never touch another ad platform. Not never, but this is the, the main thing. And uh, as soon as iOS happened, we decided like we had to make a decision. Do we want to create a new infrastructure for new offerings or do we just want to go deeper into uh, traffic sources? So we, we did that. And uh, for the, the max that we've handled is six different ad platforms for one account, but we can do up to uh, nine. And so once you know Facebook, once you understand how an ad platform works, there is like 80% of that you understand from a testing and scaling standpoint. And then the last 20% is like whatever the ad, you know, nuances of each platform. Nice. So what are the the kind of primary platforms other than Facebook that you guys are using? The same ones, you know, everyone is on in terms of like Facebook, Instagram as, as Meta, um, Google and YouTube. So I guess if you want to separate those uh, and then if we're depending on the brand at that moment, uh, TikTok or native, depending on what becomes the primary thing. Oh, OK, so do. you're doing TikTok. That's uh, really different from the rest is my understanding. Is that what? Yeah. You're doing? Yeah, and we haven't really been able to break through in terms of volume beyond like 300K a month and spend for a brand. Um, the, you know, it, it's been a challenge. So our core has still been Facebook, Instagram, Google, uh, YouTube. Okay. That well, was, that's comprehensive. Yeah. Even with the, just that, uh, have you actually found that <laughs> certain brands do better or how do you actually select the networks for your clients? Um, do they kind of say, I want to get into this or do you suggest based on the industry? Yeah, so most brands, they have a world domination mindset. So is they're just like, where can I get more traffic and where can I get more customers? And then it's, can I do it profitably based off of the attribution platform that we're using? So for most of our clients is Northbeam, um, but we have a couple others that we work with. And then from there, what are the traffic channels that are actually working? How can we maximize those? So we have a client right now, a consulting client that is uh, spending 2 million a month. And they're like, before we go to additional platforms, let's further maximize on Facebook before trying to figure out and crack YouTube. YouTube is a massive opportunity for their business, but way easier to just go from two to 3 million a month uh, and spend. So that makes sense. So how does it, how long does it take to kind of ramp up to that, that amount? Cause that amount is enormous. Uh, is it kind of like a 30 day process or how do you, how do you scale? <laughs> uh, which, which amount or. To oh, just, uh, let's, just talk, let's, okay. uh, let's say Facebook, you know, you, okay. you basically started the Facebook ads. That's kind of your main focus. How does it build into, okay, we're ready to crank it and you start pushing money into it? Yeah. So um, in terms of how we approached it from like iOS like standpoint and all the privacy changes were first, we, we have this core competency. What are other platforms that we want to learn and how do we want to get better at those and hire consultants and go through courses and that kind of thing. Then when it comes to existing brands, it depends on how much opportunity we feel there is on a platform. So if they're already spending like, say in this example of 2 million a month, there are opportunities of like, it could, the lever could be uh, creatives. It could be new landing pages. It could be um, a specific uh, additional offers, for example. But we're relative, especially at that volume, we're way more conservative. The conservative amount is still meaningful for most businesses. Like the testing budget is $2,000 per day, you know, for a new offer. 
for most businesses that is beyond their monthly budget you know, or their daily budget on on everything sorry i'd say so, monthly <laughs> yeah yeah i mean <laughs> yeah no, that's, that's, that's amazing. So you basically, so you have to qualify your clients prior to bringing them in. Do you say, Hey, what's your ad spend before you even start kind of discussing it? Yeah, for sure. So we decided, we recently made this decision uh, in the, from a strategic standpoint that one, we're not a media buying agency anymore. So we had to make a decision. We are a creative first agency or creative studio mm -hmm. and there's a full spectrum of what that means in terms of there's the actual image or video as one component and then copy as the other so there's diversity in copy but from an image standpoint there's image and video and then the production costs required from that they scale you know and they're they're very vast and so there's post-production versus working with creators versus working with studios and the studio started a thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars and so uh, we're definitely on the lower end of that on the production standpoint, but we decided that we know that the lever from media buying is not media buying. It's creative primarily. And of course, offer other stuff, but like from, from what a media buyer can own, it's creative. And from that creative media buying becomes now secondary. And anyone who isn't making that adjustment, it's going to cost them a lot of money in the future because they're going to react when it's too late. Ah, I'd love that. You know, that the creative first mindset is not typical <laughs> for, no. for ad companies most of the time. It's like, oh yeah. Okay. We did all the work now, whatever graphic designer just make something. Right. <laughs> that's yeah. That's just, yeah. Our biggest clients were testing 60 plus assets a month, you know? And so wow. what, when we're doing that, we, you need to, you need to spend to actually justify that and the testing budget to allow for that. But, um, the, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in that way uh, without the systems for production, for analysis, et cetera. So um, we, we committed uh, to that. And um, after that, we're like, okay, how do we actually ex uh, scale all that creative across platforms, across uh, different offers, uh, across geographies, if, if that's what we're doing. So that was the first adjustment that we made. We're a creative studio, then media buying. So that was number one. And then the second thing is we changed our approach to our client relationships of like, we want levels to a million a month. So it takes a degree of courage and experience and like commitment to do that. But we have four levels of a million a month, million a month in revenue, million a month in ad spend, million a month in gross margin of the business, million a month in net margin. And that is a multi-year journey. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, so when you actually sign them up, uh, is it, do you say it's going to be six, 12, two years or how do you work the contract with that yeah so um for from a commitment standpoint like we're our messaging is aligned to maximizing our average order value and lifetime value so our dream client pays seventy thousand a month and so in order to get to that amount that you know one of our clients we took them from four hundred thousand a month in revenue to four million a month in revenue so when people say 10xing your business, it's not like, oh, we go from like, you know, 4,000 to 40,000 a month. It's still a big deal for most businesses. But like to do that at 4 million a month is, is very difficult. And so that took four years, you know, like mm -hmm. that takes time. And we were on that journey and we're grateful to, to see the different phases, not, of, not only of the business, but of the entrepreneur, of like the whole team. And also for me, because that was an evolution for me as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and I think it's uh, just giving that expectation, you know, yeah, we're going to 10 X yeah. your business, but it's not going to happen like tomorrow. Cause yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. That For sure. Happen. It's all. So one of the things I did recently was I looked at the math of, uh, from a, sh a Shopify standpoint, because most of our clients are e-commerce. And so when it comes to that, the number of people who actually generate more than $2 million a year, on Shopify is something like one and a half percent of all Shopify store owners. Wow. And so that's like $2 million. And then our dream client is actually generating 10 million, 20 million plus in uh, annual revenue. And so now we're talking about the 0.1% is like what we really want to work, work with. And so just to get to the top one and a half percent is very difficult as it is. And from a marketplace standpoint, and then we want to get to, you know, the 0 0.5, 0.1% of the market. And so in order to do that, our operations have to look different. Our approach, it has to be different. And then the client who's involved, there are people who are doing $10 million a year in revenue and coasting, you know, and they're, they're happy with maximizing profits and kind of uh, stabilizing their revenue. And that's fine. We're just not that type of agency. I, we've seen that there's 
two types of agencies when it comes to advertising. There's the scaling agency or there's the profit agency. And so we're, we're the scaling agency that generates more revenue. The profit agency optimizes existing revenue to get more profit. You know, that's just different mindset. That's, well, that's incredible, you know, because that means your whole target market is comprised of just one and a half percent of yeah. Shopify stores. Do you, yeah. how do you qualify that? Do you, do you target them specifically or what's your approach to actually finding and qualifying these businesses uh, that yeah. have that kind of potential? Yeah, we do it through events. We do it through like podcasts, interviews, that kind of stuff. We're doing outbound uh, email, LinkedIn, um, lots of education. It's it's primarily the first filter is uh, messaging, right? Mm -hmm. Like our positioning. And so if they don't want to be the market leader, if they don't, if they're not obsessive about thinking about a million dollars a month in revenue and then going through million a month in revenue, ad spend, gross margin, if they're not even thinking about that, we don't want to work with them because it would just be a retainer for us. And that's not interesting. Um, where we make all of our money, where real profit is, is obviously on the higher end because the costs don't scale uh, with, the, uh, with, with what we're charging, but we're charging based off of a result, right? So for them, if, as long as the numbers make sense, it's not how profitable or what's my cost structure to deliver the service. It's, am I getting the result that they want? And that justifies it. I love that. Yeah, well, and I think at that level, like that's how they're going to qualify you. There's no way you'll yeah. justify your, you know, fee <laughs> if you're yeah. not getting, here's the number. You know, with that yeah. said, though, what happens with a lot of agencies is they do do the setup, they get everything rolling, and then they get yeah. fired. So yes. what's your, uh, you know, tips for not getting fired after you get success <laughs> for those clients? Yeah, how do you not get fired? I don't know. That's a million dollar question. Um, so the we we've been fired so at, at the highest level for me personally i'm sure there's more levels to this the uh, highest level for me was we we're managing i was looking over 7 million a month in spend we were personally managing 4 million dollars a month in spend we had record spend record revenue record profitability of first time cpa uh and numbers couldn't be better and we got fired on a two minute call like i got i personally got fired on a two minute call so i don't think there's a way to be bulletproof on that I'm just telling you straight up, like it happens at all levels. Um, it's happened at, you know, people steal our campaigns and do it without us. And they ended up going out of business and that's happened multiple times as well. And so I have a bunch of those stories. I think the, the underlying thing is what are you doing to keep uh, presenting and increasing the value that you're adding into a company? And so if your business is about minimal like lower average order value and maximizing your uh, client volume there is a way that you can systematically create real value and perception of value on a monthly basis and that happens through communication that happens through presentations that happens through different education that you're doing including stuff like this and you're sharing results or ideas or new inputs with them that makes them actually more result like more money or whatever the actual deliverable is or the perception of more value I think there's there's a lot to be said about that. Our model is different because we don't want a lot of clients. Our model is what are you doing this week or, or this month, this week, today for my business to make it better? And it, I don't think that's an approach that most business owners want, most agencies want. It's very taxing from a talent standpoint and from a mental standpoint. Like it's not for everyone. It requires a different type of person to be obsessive. And for us, we want that. We're designing for that. And the expectation is, what have you done for me lately? You know, that is the way that they operate. And uh, we're happy to play that game because we're constantly looking for ways to get better. Uh, an example of that is we have a client that we've accomplished all the three levels, but the first three levels, million a month in revenue, ad spend, and gross margin. The final frontier and I haven't personally accomplished this on a brand that we started this, like all, like accomplished all the different levels. We have accomplished this with one of our clients or two of our clients, but we haven't done this in the way from zero, which is a million a month in net margins and like net income after all expenses, including a 70K a month, whatever retainer. And it's like, what is what does it take to do that? And so for what we did is, we, I hired a CFO, I did financial modeling, I looked at the contribution margin percentages that we want and all the different metrics that uh, take that are required to hit a million a month because I had to fight to get the actual financial statements. And once I got financial statements, I'm doing this financial modeling. And now we have clarity 
on what our targets are, no bullshit to hit 1 million a month in net income. And now we can work back backwards from that and we can do the pacing on a daily basis. And I can almost predict of what the gross margin and net margins are gonna be on a daily basis. Most agencies aren't gonna do that work because they that's not the game they're playing and that's fine. But we're just all in on this game. That's awesome. Well, it must be some kind of, uh, you know, onboarding you do, because I'm guessing you're going to have to really review the business's financials to say like, hey, our goal is to get you to a million dollars in profitability a month. So we're going to have to understand yeah. all of your expenses. Is that part of the process? Yeah, there's a dating, there's a dating period, you know, there's a dating period and um, they have to trust us and we have to trust them. And we both have to earn each other's like respect through actions, mm -hmm. not words. And um, sometimes that happens in weeks. Uh, sometimes that happens over quarters, you know, sometimes years. And um, the even this person, we've worked with this person for this client for a while, it's still it's like, this is the most sensitive information in our business. And, um, you know, from a financial standpoint. And so we want to be respectful of that. And at the same time, like not use that against them, not use that to whatever, you know, negotiate or, or whatever. Um, we can see how much they're making and we want to, respect that trust and use that to get what we want, you know, and get what they want. That's, it's completely aligned. That That's huge. Well, and, you know, your model does sound uh, intensive <laughs> from the, the <laughs> yeah. customer standpoint, but for I, everyone. well, I think moving forward, just in terms of what's happening with AI and, you know, all the economic changes and everything like that, I think the, the lifetime value of every client that you have is going to be the most valuable thing that you can operate on because yeah. you, you won't be able to afford the turnover essentially. Yeah, we're, we're optimizing for profit. We're not optimizing for retainer size. We're not optimizing for just lifetime value or, you know, how many clients we have or how much spend we have. Like as a business owner, for me, I know that I'm the cash flow business. I'm not, my, my agency can be sellable. I, that's not what I'm optimizing for at the moment. I want cash flow. Um, and I want to maximize that. And I think we're hitting a tipping point in our business where all the, like the previous decade of me running this business now has got to a point that for every client that I bring on that's spending a million a month or more, it, so much of it goes to the bottom line that I can maximize a, a lot of the, you know, hard work that I've done before. That's fantastic. I, th I think the approach is amazing. I like the long-term uh, kind of aspect of onboarding people. Uh, and I really like how you talked before about uh, how you're focusing on creatives versus everything else that agencies usually focus on. Uh, yeah. How did you come to that kind of uh, pivot point where you said like, hey, creatives are going to be the driver rather than copy or objectives or, you know, some other uh, parameter? By being stuck every single day for months and we're like what are we doing with our lives like how, why are we not able to break through and it was because like if you look at things like long enough and if you keep banging your head against the wall eventually you just realize we're doing the wrong thing and um it doesn't matter how cool and sexy your testing strategy is your your scaling strategy is your overall manual bidding or any kind of hack like we just don't believe in that we believe in systems over hacks and so we have a series of systems in our business that outperform short-term hacks. And so for when, when the actual media buying side is maxed out and we're maximizing every single thing that we know about how to do things in platform, you have to go to the next step. And then and you have to look for other answers. And so it was very obvious that uh, it, it was creative. And then we, we were doing creative for brands, but the difference in terms of the mindset was most agencies, even if they're supporting the creative process, they are not doing raw production, raw production of images, videos, or copy. And so if you're not doing that now, you're at the whim of what the client thinks they should invest in new creatives. And the client wants to spend zero on creatives. I don't know why that is, but this is like, the, even with bigger businesses, they're, they don't have a raw production budget. That's not a thing. So we have to educate them. We have to educate ourselves on what are the scale of raw produ production budgets that we want. Oh, that's amazing. And then so, work on that. So you don't include the production as part of your retainer, you know, the service essentially. So the way it works is when we work with clients, this, the thing that we change in our messaging is that we actually integrate two departments into a business. We integrate a media buying department where there's a head of performance, there's a senior media buyer, there's a backup. Uh, senior media buyer, as well as an account manager. So you get the, basically those three, four people. Then you get a creative department with a creative director. You get a copywriter, video, senior video editor, 
another uh, graphic designer, as well as a UGC manager. So you get like eight people, two leaders, and two departments. And so for someone to go through the process of, you know, writing the job uh, outline, actually doing the post, uh, recruiting, uh, interviewing, hiring, uh, onboarding, managing, firing, replacing, we do all of that in one swoop, copy paste it into a company. And so from a value standpoint, that is, you know, high, high value, and, but also like from a, a time standpoint perception. And then when it comes to that whole process, we can't put in a raw production budget because some brands have a high production budget. They, their expectation is that they want to spend $10,000, $20,000 a month on create, on raw production, whereas mm -hmm. other brands, is, it's not that. And so um, we purposely don't charge on top of that. We don't, um, we don't uh, take a percentage. Like we, we can, but like the thing is we're aligned, we're incentivized to spend more. And so what is the, we don't spend more just to spend more. We have to hit business objectives in order to spend more. And that is a privilege and that is, that's a responsibility. And so for that, in order to spend more, we need all the different resources in order to hit that goal and then hit the business goal. And uh, we just, we're very direct and very transparent of like, here's this creator costs $200 or whatever it is. And we tell them like, this is exactly what our costs are instead of trying to upsell that further. Um, and the goal is we want to spend more. And so it, it, it aligns, it, it, it feels better. To do that. that that makes total like the way you explain it makes total sense to me because i i always uh kind of struggle with that because i think creative is the most important thing uh just like you're saying and really if you want to meet the objectives then you need good creative whether the client thinks it's valuable or not right yeah i'm not <laughs> i'm not trying to make like an extra five or ten percent on a 200 creator right like the goal is we want to get to 70k a month or more on big spend and that everyone is winning. And it's just like it, it, the, when it, the whole relationship becomes transactional, they lose trust, we lose trust. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. So for the uh, your actual creative process though, because really I think when people hear marketing, that's what they think we do like 99% of the time, which is make funny ads or whatever. Uh, right. <laughs> so, so for you guys, uh, do you have uh, you know a scientific process for like how you make yeah. creatives? Yeah. Um, Depends on how like nerdy we want to go, but I'll give you guys like different stages of it. So the biggest challenge we had, and I think like especially agencies who aren't doing creatives, this is the easiest place to start. First, you have to find a system for inspiration. That is like the core of everything. Because what happens is like, if you say, if you look at a system, the system is what is the input? What is the process? What is the output? And the input starts with ideation. That's just the truth. And so if you don't have ideas, it's because you don't have the uh, system for inspiration. That took us such a long time to understand. I don't know why, but it, it did. And that was the foundation. What we did is that every person who's involved, we don't have a massive team, right? It's only like 17 person people. Um, the core team who's operational, their responsibility is to post one idea every single day in an inspiration Slack channel that we have. That happened out of desperation because we're like, we're running out of ideas. Like, what do we do next? So there's a, a website called foreplay.co. Um, and what they do is you can look at different ad ideas, what other media buyers are saving, and you can save your own ideas as well. And so it is a requirement in our company that you have to save, you have to share one ad idea a day, ideally. Like, if you don't share an idea the whole week, there's something that happens, whatever, there's like exceptions. But the goal is we want you to share at least one. Some people share multiple a day. Um, some, some people spend a lot of time on Instagram or TikTok. And so they're present and, and they have a lot more than others. But there are ways to find ideas. So the first step is create a Slack channel or create some place where you can talk to your team. If you have two people, five people, doesn't matter. It's just daily requirement is you must post an idea every day and you have accountability around that to make sure that people actually do it. That's like step. I love After that. The, yeah, yeah, like our HR person does it, like we're, everyone's involved uh, in that. And so that's like step one. Um, I shared this with a, a, a like $100 million like e-commerce company and they're like, uh, we our media buyers don't even do that. And so it's like, 
yeah, our media buyers are switching to creative first media buyers, right? So that's that's important. So you have an abundance of ideas. Then what happens is like people started, I'll tell you like the whole life cycle of this process because we've had a bunch of ideas that no one's talking about it. Media buyers are ignoring the creative people. The creative people are ignoring the media buyers. It's like, why are we sharing into an abyss, right? So then you must engage with, especially your clients on the ideas, ideas that other people are putting in effort for your clients so you can hit your bonus. Like it doesn't make sense. Everyone should be on the same page. So once first you have ideas, then you talk about the ideas and you have some interaction. And that's usually where the ideas get better. The third step of that is where do we save the ideas? So there's a backlog. And most people won't do this because again, it's more work, but it is the whole point of coming up with ideas and having conversations on these ideas is so that when you need the, when you read, run out of ideas, you have something to go to and you're not freaking out thinking about what you're going to do next. So you have a backlog. And then once you have a bunch of ideas, now you go into production and that's where the actual brief process starts. So most people just jump into, okay, what do I write in terms of instructions to a video editor or someone on my team or even for myself? Like, what do I, what am I doing with this creative before doing like the start? That's actually the start of this, the system. That's not the input. You need the input, which is ideas. Ah, love that. Yeah, well, and I think part of the creative process that people don't understand a lot of times is that it's just like any other skill set. Like if you practice it enough, you're going to have lots of ideas all the time. But if you never practice yeah. it, then, yeah, you're not going to have a lot of ideas. So, <laughs> yeah, what what team's going to win? Right. Like when you're looking at a team or even like even like more doesn't mean better. But if a team, if an individual is looking at five ads a day. 10 ads a day, that person has way more context than someone who is just churning out and churning and burning ads for one brand um, in like their own kind of like silo. Well, and I love how you mentioned TikTok too, because I, I get the TikTok ads, but the TikTok ads are completely different than Very every different. other platform. It's, yeah, you can't even tell their ads half the time. The only reason I realized, and I, what's funny is I have uh, like curated collections of uh, TikTok posts and sometimes I'll want to save it and you can't save ads. And that's when I'll realize that's an ad because I was about to save right. it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, with it, it's really interesting because TikTok ads work on Facebook, but Facebook ads don't work on TikTok. Mm. But. No, oh, well, let's talk about that kind of the the unique uh, kind of creative aspects of each platform. Because I know TikTok, it seems like the more genuine you get, the more unproduced that it looks while still containing good information. Those are usually the better ads versus uh, say Facebook. I mean, do Facebook ads where they just feel like a post work or? Yeah, yeah I think for, for us, what really helped is like, are we committed to creating, or are we committed to doing whatever it takes from a creative standpoint to get stuff working? If the answer is yes, the rest of the decisions might become a lot easier. If we're gonna complain about each step of the process or not do the things that are so obvious that we need to do, then this is gonna fail and like, we should just stop now. That's like the honest conversation. And what I mean by that is if you want to do TikTok and you don't have creators, like you're going to fail. Like you need people who are going to do the content. And that's why it's so difficult for a lot of brands. Even if you take the algorithmic side or like algorithm optimization, on, put, put that on the side. It's just you need creators. If you don't have a creator budget, if you don't have a process of coming up with the ideas and sending them a brief, if you don't um, actually convert their raw assets into an ads and ad, and then you don't have enough volume of it, all of it is just not going to work. That's just like fundamentals of the platform that no one tells you about until you're in it. And you're like, why do I keep failing? And so that's the conclusion that we came to. So for each platform, we have to decide like what is required. And so I'll give you a perfect example for YouTube. Our team is not ready, wasn't ready for long form videos that are very deep in the, the requirement on like the copywriting that's required and editing that's required and the depth of customer research that's required is very different than what we've been doing on Facebook. And so we struggled with that. And so we are hiring different people and getting different uh, support externally to bridge that gap. And it's like, are we all in on YouTube or not. If we're not, then let's pull back and commit, like say that, that we're not going to do it. But we made that commitment. And one of the goals we set for this one brand is like, we, it would be amazing 
if we could spend a million dollars a month on YouTube just for this one brand on top of the 40,000 a day that we're spending on Facebook and um, uh, about like 10,000 a day that we're spending on Google. It's just like, we want to get to a million a month on on YouTube, but our infrastructure, our systems do not align with hitting that goal right now. And that was the honest conversation that we needed to have. And so we hired a person actually, and uh, we just fired them uh, after like four weeks uh, approximately because it, there was a mis misalignment. There was a like completely different set of expectations on um, what the standard was, communication, and I take responsibility for that. And so like that was a failure on my part. And so we have to make that decision. And then now we're going to go to the next rep, the next round, you know, of, of optimization. So, man, well, you, it sounds like you have all your numbers dialed in that you could even make that kind of judgment call that quickly. Because most of the time, if you hire somebody who's like kind of taking on a new program, essentially, you'd be like, yeah. oh, we'll give them a quarter, six months, like all that. <laughs> That's not unusual. So the fact that you're able to say like, nope, this was wrong in four yeah. weeks. That's that's a yeah, testament to what you have set up. <laughs> this was wrong. It's my fault first. I'm sorry I wasted your time. What uh, We did an exit call of like, you give us feedback of where we messed up. We had got a list of like seven things. I'm like, do you want feedback on your side? And we gave them feedback as well, honestly. Um, and uh, he was appreciative of the feedback. It wasn't set up for him to uh, win. I had a baby recently. So it was like, there's things outside of my control. And it is it is what it is. Like, we're going to learn from this and move on. No, that's that's fantastic. Uh, now for the the creative side, because I know you, you have your internal process, you have your ideas coming up all the time. Where does the client come into talking about creative? Or do you just say like, no, go away. We know what's right. <laughs> yeah. So there are some businesses who have a lot of strong opinions on creatives, but most of the time, it's just too much. It's too much volume. There's too much going on. They're just involved in the approvals. And mm -hmm. it's way easier when, when some, you know, if you've ever been through the process of like coming up with a brand or a logo, no one knows what they want, but they know what they definitely don't want. And mm -hmm. so it's easy to say no to uh, what they don't like versus like, I would like this. And so usually the people who are giving feedback on the creative process, they have so many responsibilities. They're not going through inspiration. They're not looking at ads. They're not studying. Um, and so we we do most of that heavy lifting and they're just saying yes and no. Okay. So you're, you're guiding them in the process basically to close to a finished product. And then you're like, okay, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because like, it's not even that. It's just like, okay. do you like it or, or like, do you approve or not? And then it, it's because we have so much data and learnings from everything that we're doing, so much of the volume of like what's actually working right now or not, so much of the ideation of like, here's all the things that we looked at, hundreds of ads. I think these are the, the next five or whatever that we're going to test. And um, we know the type of creators that's working, th that are working, the hooks that are working. So whatever their input is, is more gut and intuition. And we will, we value that as well. Um, but most of the time, it's just too much for them to like have meaningful input. So we just do all of it. And um, they just say yes, sir. Easy. Yeah, I love that. Well, and, and who's going to argue with like, and here's the data and here's the examples. <laughs> yeah. and Here's what happened here. And here's what they're like, oh, it's, yeah. it's good. <laughs> I, yeah, I did, yeah. I did we startup get... brand development. So I'm I'm jaded with the process. Yeah. And uh, just to say, you know, shows how much the clients trust you. And so it that trust is earned, right? So because as soon as you mess it up, then they're like, what happened that week? And then you mess it up two more weeks. It's like, you keep misspelling my company name or whatever the thing is, you know? It's like, we've, we've done that many times. It happens, uh, we're human, but um, we do our best to like make sure that when we say we're gonna do something, we do it. And uh, a simple example of that is like, we do best ads presentations in a Google slide every Friday. And so we had a situation where we were missing them operationally. We were do posting them on Monday. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but if we said we're doing it on Friday, but you don't get it, and especially when things aren't going well, you're looking for like, you, you're anxious. You're like trying to figure out what, what, what do I do? Like, it's these guys, what are they doing? I don't understand. Why didn't you send a presentation? So it sounds small, but it's like, we said we're gonna do it, or we should send it. And the reason I bring up the best ad pre best ads presentation is because where we have a really quick feedback loop. So we come up with an idea, we create it. Once we create it and we launch it, we know by next Monday if it worked or not. And then we know as percentages, what is our win rate of creatives every week? 
And then we share that. And then we're sharing exact winners that are working as well. And then we're learning on, on those winners. But we know our target is we want 25% win rate of a concept. So we have concepts, which is like the idea, and we have variations. So we'll change the hook or we'll change whatever, the one element of it as a variation. And so from a concept standpoint, when we launch 10 concepts, for example, we know for four concepts, we know one will work. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's our target. And sometimes we do amazing and we have 40% win rates instead of 20%, 25%. And then other times we've had recently, we have pixel issues and we had 0% win rates. And we have three other agencies involved and like we've never had a 0% win rate. But it's like when it's 0%, we know something's really bad. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be yeah. that'd be an easy number. Like, oh crap, fix yeah. everything. Zero yeah. percent uh, for multiple weeks, by the way. For it's multiple, yeah, yeah but you know what happens. Oh, it's yeah, at, that, at, that's, that like at forty thousand a, a day in spend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not good. It's not pretty. Uh, well, let, let's talk about. Well, actually, let's talk about the actual creative process because when I I sure. teach people how to make content, a lot of times it's like teaching. I don't know. Uh, I don't even know a comparison. Rocket science. Yeah, <laughs> Where it's sometimes, like, all right, yeah. stock photography versus doing a photo shoot. Um, right. How do you come up with, because that sounds like you're doing a ton of creatives. So do yeah. you, what's the actual process for actually creating the designs? And are they primarily kind of static images or are they always carousels or are they videos all the time? Or what's, um, how do you actually produce the content? Do you hire the actors or studio yeah. space or all that stuff? Yeah, that was only 20 questions. I'll try to answer. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How do you make creatives? That, that's <laughs> Tell me everything. <laughs> 12 minutes. So um, yeah, so what we what we do, like the first part, what I was sharing is all inspiration. That's like the input part. Then the actual like process is is as following, as, as follows. So after we have an idea, we do a brief. In the brief, we are giving instructions of like all the way from like what do we want to the naming convention of the final video to be, uh, mm -hmm. including like links to the brand documents, including like what we can say or not, all of that, as well as hook, hook one, hook two, hook three that we have, as well as like the structure for the copy, I, I, like everything is, is in that brief. Then all of this is in ClickUp and it goes through a production process. And so the next step is we actually start production. And so it's, we have overflow externally, but most of it's done internally between like video editors that we have. The video mm -hmm. editor gets the brief. They're going through the process of production. Uh, if they have any you know questions, they're going to the creative director and clearing that up. They do the first round. Once they do the first round, we have a, a internal approval of like, do we like it or not? Or are we on the same page? once and then it goes into revision so we're doing that like a uh, loop until we're happy with it internally once that uh is basically approved internally now it goes into a queue to get it approved by the client and mm -hmm. so they'll go through that same feedback loop of like i don't like this etc or is approved immediately and we go back and forth and do that once that's approved it goes into a queue for launching and we don't launch every single day we have clients that do better on specific days and then also our testing periods are over seven days uh, for most uh, platforms. And so we have to launch on, on we, we don't still want to launch on a Saturday, but, you know, for most clients, it's not a good idea. And so it goes into that queue. And then once it gets launched, there's like partially launched and then fully launched um, in terms of we're launching a couple assets or, or all of them. So that is the process. Um, there is one part I missed that, uh, left out, which was once we have an asset for review internally, we have like a Slack channel where we talk about it. Like communication is important. Everyone says that, but like we need to like talk about stuff uh, so that we're giving feedback from different perspectives. The media buyer will have a performance-based perspective. The account manager uh, will have a client-specific and messaging-specific perspective on preferences and, and brand and stuff like that. Um, and the creative director or you know copywriter or anyone else will have like more fundamentals of like copy or creatives or what what should happen. So we do that process slightly in uh, in Slack, but most of it is in ClickUp. That is our production process. And then we do hire creators. Um, we do them. So we recently hired a UGC manager who does outbound prospecting to get creators. That is so we can have like a different pool from what is inside of a lot of these platforms. Uh, Cause we use platforms, we use um, the uh, outbound side and then we use like customer testimonials as well. Nice. Wow. That's uh that's quite a process I can imagine with, cause you were saying for any one say ad campaign, you're going to have how many create like what do you end up with in terms of the creatives that you actually test is it just two yeah or do you have say 10 and they're all different campaigns 
Yeah. So how it works is that if we have like 100% of a ad, ad account like budget, so say it's like 100,000 a month, right? From there, 20% is usually where we max out. If everything is working, 20% is where we max out at uh, testing budget. So that could mm -hmm. be like uh, like 20,000 per month. Based off of that, like just to make it a round number, say $1,000 a day is like the testing budget for Facebook. And so for, for that, if we want a $100 CPA, we we have a target for how we look at testing budgets per concept. And so it could be 2X target CPA. So it's $200 a day. And so if we have $1,000 a day testing budget and each test gets $200 a day, we can run five tests at any time. Hmm. Based off of that, we decide how much to produce. Because we, if we overproduce, then we're, we're wasting money too. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're, you're bouncing back and forth between the process to make sure that you're not wasting money creating stuff that's not necessary. Or yeah, we yet. have to be, we have to be very fluid because you asked like how much of it is video versus images. I remember your questions. Um, <laughs> how much of your stuff is video versus images. And so stuff like that, if videos are working, we're going to do more videos. Like it's just obvious, but there are situations, especially right now on Facebook, images are working more. So we switch over to that and then we keep testing and, and find the next one. Wow. Oh, it's, uh, it's amazing the amount of tracking that you guys do and, and just the communication structure, you know, with, uh, yeah. we have Amara, one of our, uh, mentors with our mastermind she's like an expert at ClickUp, <laughs> and it's like oh man maybe ClickUp is the solution you need for this level of uh team integration yeah i'm guessing do you do you have yeah. a headquarters or is everybody remote everyone's remote so we're in six countries six wow okay yeah that's that's a lot <laughs> so you have time yeah, period yeah. issues all the time too or is it same no, content? No, because we it's again based off of trust, right? So if you do your job, like if you're taking an hour in the day for um, you know, for a gym session or like your kid or whatever, it's like there are outputs that what that we want and communication expectation. And then we have time doctor to track and stuff. But if we've noticed the more we micromanage, the worse results we get. So hmm. um at, at least for us. So we have a sweet spot in that with where there's accountability with the team lead as well as with the ops operations manager. And um, I know on paper, it's like six countries, like whatever, three or four time zones. How do people, how does anyone do their job? But it is based off of like a, like commitment and, and trust and respect of like, you're getting paid to do this. Um, do it. Do you agree? No, then this is not the place for you. And like, it's, I don't know, it's just it seems robotic, but it is what it is. No, well, I think you have to have that level of detail to manage people in six countries. And I think the reason why it doesn't work a lot of times is because they don't have these systems set up that you have set up. And yeah, because yeah. if you're just kind of like, hey, all over the place, we'll just be on the seat of our pants all the time, which most startups are, uh, yeah. there's no way that that it would work because you lose yeah. track. Yeah, that's part of the thing of just like why brands hire us instead of like hiring because they can like the every all the people I just outlined of like the people that we integrate they can hire all of those people as well there's not like a secret location where we're getting these people from right mm -hmm. it's more so company DNA how like what our standards and communication expectations are how we operate the level of accountability we have training and support and then like how we're paying them how we're incentivizing them so for example like media buyers get a small percentage of the retainer that we get. And so they're technically uh, like revenue share partners, right? And so the more money that we, like ad pros makes, the more money that they make, and they're making like, because some of the people are offshore, they're making two, four, five X of what they would make anywhere else. And I'm happy to do that because they're also going to have a tough, tougher time finding another job. Uh, that's number one. But second is that they're now directly financially aligned with me so that when I make money as a founder when the business makes money as like top line they make money directly correlated to that no bs not like ifs ands or ors and all these parameters that are complicated it's like here's how much money came in for that specific client you get a percentage and then the more you spend the breakthrough that we have on creative or whatever everyone benefits because like bonus structures are aligned nice i love that well and even even that though it still goes back to the tracking because if you don't know all of your numbers and you don't have everything yeah. systematically set up then even if you said, hey, you'll get a bonus, but you don't have any right. structure for it, you'll just be like, hey, you said something about a bonus. Like, is that, yeah. how does that this work? Is, <laughs> this happens everywhere. It's so demoralizing. So we pay our bonus structures on a on one metric for media buyers, two metrics for creative. So our creative metrics are um, 
on based off of volume, how much you produce, and then based off of performance, how much are you winning? So that's they, they have different incentives. But from a media buying standpoint, it's like, here's how much I spent for the client. Here's how much my percentage is. I can calculate my base plus my bonus at any time. And mm -hmm. they know. And then when they're when they do a better job or the business as a whole, between all the eight people or so involved, do a better job, they get more money. They make more money. And they, then they make that money and they get instant gratification of it that month because we pay it out on a monthly basis, not quarterly or annually. Oh, I love it. That, that's a great model. Well, and I know just uh, I was in real estate when I was in college and it was like the first thing you do when you get a listing, you calculate your commission. <laughs> right. For that'll sure. be the motivator for the next uh, you know, whatever 90 days it's yeah. gonna take to, to get the job done. So, you know, individuals should be able to do that. And it's really neat that you have that kind of transparency that allows them to see, like, hey, no, this is directly leading to you putting more money in your pocket tomorrow. Yeah. And it's not like I'm like you're making more money, but then ad pros is making less money and the client is making even less money. It's like, no, 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 like client makes most money. They're first have to make money in order to pay ad pros. And then when ad pros makes money, you make money directly at the same level, at the same proportion so that we're all on the same page. And then just when you do something that makes a difference, other people make money because of you and vice versa. So that feels good too. Oh yeah. Well, it's just seeing the connection between it. And at the end, the clients gain what they want and you know, yeah. everything is right with the world. <laughs> the the underlying thing is we want to break records and we want to break records as often as we possibly can. And it's not fun because like what happens is like you break records month on month. And then when you stop breaking records, you're like, I thought we're, this is just going to happen every single month forever. And so, you know, when things are hard, that's when people like really like we earn our uh, retainer because then we have to figure life out. Well, I love how you said too, like, you know, the companies that hire you guys could technically afford to probably hire your entire yeah. team if they want to, but yep. they can't because you just spent 10 years putting together a system of marketing and all the things that you guys do that. And that's what they're hiring. They're not hiring yeah. people. They're hiring the if system. You, if you just look at the cost, just the HR side, the cost is ridiculous. Like just to bring in eight people um, and like, assuming they even do their jobs, like just for them to show up to their job. That's like one thing. And then it's, are they going to perform? We're in a performance culture. I look at myself as we are a digital sales team. You don't keep your sales team just because they're nice people or that they speak well or whatever. It's, it's not about that. It's like, do does your salesperson sell? If they don't sell, next salesperson. Uh, no, it uh, sounds harsh, but you know, if we're not in this as a charity. <laughs> and no, even if you were, not even a nonprofit all. needs useful people to do the job. Otherwise, it's going to fall apart. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, I've taken up the entire time. Uh, let's go ahead and ask the audience. Mickey, I'm sure you have some burning questions. Uh, you usually do. Uh, Axel, you too. Let's hear them. All right. They're typing. Uh, but this has been fantastic. It, it sounds like you have a dialed in operation. And in order to operate at the level you are with the clients of the size that you're you're dealing with, you know, $40,000 a day ad spend, I think you have to have a structure like this. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, maybe, if, uh, if, okay. if we could unmute, I think it's way better. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe you, you, sorry, I should have said that. <laughs> She's already typing. I was already typing. Sorry. Um, I'd love to learn more about how you built your performance culture, specifically as you grew your team, both from those first initial hires all the way up to now where you, you've got a larger team and you're still trying to maintain that really strong culture. Yeah, uh, I think I'm wildly irrational. I think that's the foundation of it, um, being unreasonable and being a little bit like insane. Um, it really helps. Um, so that that's honestly like the, the first part of it. Uh, I think the other part also is like, um, you know, I've had like different traumatic things happen to me in terms of like from a from a childhood standpoint, like I've, I've gone deep there. And then I've also understood like what my motivations are. And I grew up in government housing. And so I made a decision that I want extreme abundance. And so I'm not there yet, but that's the commitment I've made with myself. And so I don't want just enough. I want more than enough and I want to support a lot of people. And then I want to make sure that as I'm making more, that other people around me are, are supported directly and indirectly. And so I'm directly responsible for not only like 
myself and a bunch of people I support, like handful of people, but also like my team and their, pe their people, the businesses that we're working with and, and like the 50, 100 staff, like depending on how big they are for each of the businesses. And then all the people that are actually getting impacted because we're running better ads and that changes people's lives, right? So like there's a lot of that going on um, because of like, government housing because of like not having enough money because of like going through a lot of pain like that those are huge motivators for me because I learned not to like sit in that pain and like sulk I used that and channeled it into into the business so that's like the 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 core like underlying like motivation um beyond that from a tactical like standpoint we constantly try to we're not try we're committed to keep setting a higher standard it is not a good environment for B and C players. People will hate, will hate their lives and they fire themselves. Like they leave, right? Um, from that, because it's like, this is too intense for me. And this happens with clients too. We just fired two clients uh, this week because like they're not taking advantage of our skill set. They're not taking advantage of our input. And so like, why are we here if we're just going to be button pushers? That is the complete opposite of the relationship dynamics that we want. And so it starts with me. I'm assuming if, you know, if you're the founder of the, of your agency, it starts with you, not based off of what you're saying, but based off of your actions and based off of every single action, hundreds of reps of like, they see that you, you can be imperfect. Like there's obviously times when things aren't good, but it is the pursuit of just like, this person is like, really like is going after it like they're committed to their vision and that part is so contagious because they're like I, maybe i should be as well right and what has happened because i set up small feedback loops of like i challenge my team i want them to make more money uh i get scolded by my friends of like you're paying your people too much in, in some of the especially offshore areas because like it's i can pay them 50%, 70% less, but I'm doing that because they're now buying homes, like they're doing real estate deals, like they're traveling around the world that they would have never been able to do be because they're not, they weren't in the position to, but I'm pushing them and the exchange is phenomenal, you know, of what I pay them and the value that they add versus the value that gets created for me versus the value that gets created for the client. So it's really based off of starts with you of like what you want. And then are you living that from like personally and professionally? And then does, does it actually trickle down to the team? Oh, yeah. That's uh that's killer commitment to, you know, the vision and the mission and the cause, because that's, it's super hard to do. You make it sound obvious. <laughs> but for most it, it's really hard, man. it's crazy. <laughs> So did it's so crazy. you did you start like that or was it kind of like you kind of realized over the years like I can't make you know I can't have expectations of other people to enforce my vision if I'm not 1000% committed to it myself. I wish I could take a snapshot of like 10 years ago 15 years ago of like introvert quiet couldn't make eye contact didn't know how to present no confidence constant self doubt very uh like low self esteem very difficult to like breakthrough record like all of this stuff is like this is hard work on like commitment of I just used what I didn't want and use that to like design what I want and uh it took me a long time to like get to the other side of like not being in pain all the time you know like mentally like psychologically because um if we are if we keep pushing away from pain like you're still experiencing the pain in the process and so it's taken me a long time to like optimize for pleasure and design a positive life instead of running away from pain um that's like a whole other topic but it has taken a lot of time and it's also like there's been a lot of failures um i just fail most more than most people and then i use that to to advance you know no, that's that sounds incredible. And, you know, the the personal development that has to happen to have all of those <laughs> realizations and then feel yeah. confident, so confident about them that you're like, you know what, this is just something that has to happen. And I can't. Yeah. Yeah, dude, look, look at look at what we're saying. We're saying that we're going to come into your business and I'm going to help unlock levels of million a month targets in your business that you probably even haven't defined in your business. And I'm going to show you that we're going to do that because we've already done that for other people. I dare you like that. That's the energy I'm coming. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, and I think it's uh it's a testament to all the work that you've done, you know, personally and professionally, because it's the business side is very impressive that you're able to set up all these systems, manage multiple countries, get all these new clients, and even fire clients that, you know, maybe would have kept paying you, but For didn't sure. live up to your standard. And so you fired them anyway. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a good like financial decision, but like that, those two brands were actually making our team like dumber, honestly, like mm-hmm. they were decreasing the, the IQ of our team because being complacent is contagious. And so because of how we were acting, it was actually affecting other clients and how they were operating. And that's not acceptable. Uh, well, and and from a financial standpoint, even like it, that's not acceptable either, because then you'll decrease performance on those other accounts and exactly net effect is worse company. Okay. So well, <laughs> yeah. that's super. Uh, everything you've said is, is super impressive. Love your focus on creative. I uh, love the team structure. I uh, love the performance culture because, uh, you know, most companies talk about performance culture. They'll be like, oh, work whenever you want. Take off as much time as you want. Just get your job done. But then they don't do a good job defining the job and setting the expectations and rewarding yeah. the completions and the progress and, and the performance. So, yeah, yeah, it's easy to say. But what you've done Very is probably easy to say. you're probably that one and a half percent, just like those, uh, you know, Shopify uh, two million dollar companies like. That's I'm probably... on the same journey. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where could people learn more about uh, you and AdPros? Yeah, AdPros.com is the site. Uh, Nahal at AdPros is my email. If you want to reach out on LinkedIn or, or Instagram, please do. Um, the main thing I would say here is that in, I started re- doing Facebook ads for free. Like I started with $0 a month retainers, right? And we went start did like $250 and $500 a month. And so now like $100,000 a month retainers are like a reality. And it's like, I couldn't have imagined. And so if that is something of interest or a path of yours, I'm happy to support her. You know, do you have any questions about it? Well, thank you so much for coming on. Definitely have to have you on the podcast. Uh, maybe even have you come out and talk because everything you've done is super impressive. And I think yeah, everybody in the community it. is really going to appreciate uh, just hearing it because, you, you know, we talk about it a lot, but to see a company actually uh, bust out something that aggressive and yeah. distinct is very impressive. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everyone. This has been Agencies Talk, where we talk to the top uh, marketers in the world, uh, including uh, today, of course, because that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, look for more. We're here every Friday, and we're starting to incorporate these into our live sessions uh, during the Surfer Partner Training Days. Uh, the next one of which is coming up in September. Michelle, help me out. I want to say like 17th, somewhere around there. But get the ready for mid September. September, the second uh, week of So that would be. I don't remember the exact dates, but I know it's the second week. Uh, It's probably the Thursday. So I'm going to say the 14th, tentatively the 14th, September. If you're interested, get ready to travel to Austin and you can have fun bar hopping and then gain training and marketing. (laughs) But thank you all. See you soon. Take it easy.